evening and thank you so much for joining us here on Facebook. This is all part of MedStar Health's innovative approach to healthcare. We are here on Facebook, Facebook Live, so we are taking questions and comments and bringing you all sorts of exciting information. I'm your host, my name is Megan Pringle, I work for WBAL, and I'm in a pretty remarkable place, a place I've never been before. This is the Trans Radio Lounge, and we're going to explain what that's all about. We're going to get a tour of the place and tell you how it makes things different for the patient and the doctor here at Union Memorial. So we have a remarkable night ahead of us, and I want to introduce you to our panelists because they're three pretty impressive doctors. Um, in fact, they have the most experienced interventional cardiologists in the region here to discuss everything from all the technology that you use, how far medicine has come in treating the heart. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, we would love to hear from you. Give us a like, uh, MedStar Health's page. We wanna know what you're thinking, what your questions are. Tell your friends, share this. We're gonna have great information, so it's important information as well. So just be sure to share this and follow along. We're here for an hour, and again, we would love to hear from you. So now to introduce the panel, let's get to it. So we have uh, first Dr. Naman Siddiqui. He's uh, an interventional cardiologist, and he's here with MedStar Union Memorial. We have lots of questions for you. Um, we also have Dr. John Wong. He is the um, Chief Cardiologist, uh, the Chief uh, Cardiac Catheterization Lab and Scientific Director. Who you got a long title at MedStar uh, Baltimore Cardiovascular Research. So I know you're going to give me a tour of this place later. I can't wait to show people the lounge because you said that it's been open less than a year. That's right, uh, making it open uh, around Labor Day last year. It's incredible. And finally, Dr. Tony Kalyandin, so he's going to talk to us, also answer our questions and let us know how things are going here. So we're going to start off though first with the heart itself because there's some pretty staggering statistics. We always hear if it's not from the news um, from your doctor, take care of your heart. And for good reason. Every year in the U.S., 610,000 people die from heart disease. It is the number one killer of men and women. This is all according according to the CDC. So um, another statistic uh, to share and pass along with you that uh, artery disease, it's the most common cardiac killer with 370,000 people, but this whole thing prevents that. So we want to get right to it and start with you, Dr. Siddiqui, because a lot of people who are watching on Facebook are not going to be aware of what exactly plaque is. I think you hear about it and you probably get pretty scared when it's coming from your doctor. Coronary artery disease is the most common type of heart disease. It is basically uh, plaque in the arteries of the heart that supply it with blood and restrict flow. It can lead to uh, chest discomfort, shortness of breath, and even heart attacks. Our job as interventional cardiologists is to perform a cardiac catheterization to detect these blockages and then treat them in a safe and timely fashion. So how do you do that? The historic way to do, to do that would be to do a cardiac catheterization through the groin, and that's been done safely to some degree for a long period of time, but our new way of doing that is through the transradial approach which is where we go through the wrist and do the entire procedure through the wrist. That way we can detect these blockages and fix them in any way, shape, or form um, uh, that way. That's what I always thought you did was go through the femoral artery, and I've heard that that is painstaking. Well, um, you know, it's what we were, some of us were taught back in the day, and that's how things were done because that's how we were taught. Um, and it can be done safely, but, you know, it does have some increased risks. Uh, there is about a 1% chance of a vascular complication if we do the procedure through the groin. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but you don't want to be that 1%. So, um, you know, we have, back in 2010, transitioned to the transradial approach, which essentially eliminates most of, if not all, vascular complications from the equation. I would also imagine the recovery time is a lot different. If we do the procedure through the femoral approach, uh, there's at least four to six hours of bed rest after the procedure. From the transradial approach, there's minimal to no bed rest. You're also able to leave the hospital quicker, and in some cases even leave, leave the hospital the same day after a SEND procedure. Dr. Wong, I have to imagine that's a huge advantage for you to discuss with patients. It's really huge. I mean, the transradial approach has really transformed the way we do heart catheterizations. And a common question people would say after they hear about this and the advantages is, why doesn't everybody do it? And if it's so much better, why doesn't everyone do it? And part of it is that it's a, it's a 
big learning curve. It's much harder to perform this procedure and to learn this. And doing the catheterization from the groin that Dr. Siddiqui described is something we're so comfortable with and everyone's been trained on. But learning from the radial approach um, is almost like starting from scratch. And it is very, very challenging. And so that's really been the barrier. But there are a lot of advantages to our patients. We described a couple, which is the comfort. Patients say oftentimes when they have the heart catheterization from the leg that the worst part is laying down afterwards for several hours. That's especially the case if you have back problems or breathing problems and so the nice thing about the wrist from a patient comfort standpoint is that you can sit up in a chair with a comfortable wristband on. You don't have to lay flat. Um, and the safety, I think we really need to focus in on the safety because 1% major vascular complication rate is not a large number, but if you do thousands of procedures a year, that's a large number. And the major vascular complication rate with transradial cardiac catheterizations is zero. It's not 0.1, it's zero. It's, it's, so that is what is really a benefit to our patients. I believe we actually have a video of the procedure that we can show people, which might also help explain it because it, it does seem so wild if you are used to hearing about, you know, going through the thigh and now you're talking about going through the wrist. So you know, if we can take a look at that, that would sure. be great. So this gentleman's arm is extended out and it's on a comfortable roll, okay? Next thing is I'm going to apply a little bit of numbing medicine, a little bit of lidocaine, and that's just to numb up the spot where his blood vessel is. I take my small needle, go through the blood vessel, and then come back out, pass this wire up, and sometimes it's a little tricky. Take a scalpel and make a tiny little nick here in the skin, just to make it easier for us to pass our sheath up. And this is a hydrophilic sheet that has a coating on the outside that makes it very slippery, so when it goes into the wrist, it actually doesn't hurt. And it's just as important for it to go in smoothly as it is for it to come out smoothly. You're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. Then we wet it, make it a little bit slicker, and pass it up into the wrist. Once we're in, we actually inject a little what we call radio cocktail that has a combination of some medicines including heparin, which is a blood thinner, uh, nitroglycerin, which helps dilate the blood vessel, and nicardipine, which also prevents the spasm in this arm. When I'm done, I'm going to just pull up here and take the tape off of the wrist, and then we'll see what we do is we end up putting his arm into the arm board and now when I stand and do my procedure it's as if I'm doing it from the groin but I'm actually doing it from the radial artery. So now the rest of the procedure is very similar. So here we are, we're passing up our catheter. Take it out please. And we're going to see if this gentleman has any blockages. Sir, take a deep breath in and hold it. Test. Okay, breathe normally now please. Great job. So we're going to take our pictures, hit it, great, so far so good sir, okay, we're taking pictures, I hope you're comfortable, okay, it's really good right? Yes sir. Beautiful blood vessels and usually at this point uh, patients don't realize we've already started but we're almost finished the procedure, we're actually finishing up pictures of the left side and now we're going to get ready to take pictures of the right side. So we're going to exchange this catheter out over a wire. Going in with our catheter to engage the right coronary artery. Okay, hold it in. There we go. Back it out. Let's take a picture. Ready? Ready. Inject. Beautiful. So, uh, sir, I have great news for you. You have no blockages in your blood vessels. Isn't that great news? Mm -hmm. And we're almost finished. I have one more picture to take, which is to see how well your heart squeezes. And during that picture, you may feel a little warm and flush from the contrast. And when we're done, I'm going to put a little wristband on, and you can go home in an hour and a half. How's that sound? Good. Great. And, sir, take a deep breath in for me and hold it. Good. Okay, back it out. Okay. 
Right south, you feel some of it. Here comes that picture, okay? You're gonna feel warm and flushed. It's only gonna last for a second. Touch. Zero, please. EDP of 26. Ready? Inject. Great, perfect. Well, your heart is nice and strong. You have absolutely no blockages in your blood vessels, so we're all done, okay? okay. Here you can see we did the whole procedure from the small catheter in the wrist. There's nothing to really clean up. There's no bleeding around it, but we'll do wipe it off. And then I put this band, this comfortable wristband on that actually has an air diaphragm that inflates and holds pressure, and it's a Velcro strap. It's called a transradial band, or TR band. And we put it on, it's like a wristband, a little watch band. It doesn't hurt, it's nice and comfortable. We inflate this, the air diaphragm, with this syringe. We slowly take out the sheath, and then reduce the amount of air in there. And you can see that the whole procedure was done this way, through the wrist. And this stays on for about 90 minutes, an hour and a half, and then patients can go home after that. Yeah, Megan, people are surprised. I mean, this video was edited, so it's about five minutes long, but the actual procedure, when it was unedited, it was about seven and a half minutes long. So most of the patients that we do can't believe we're actually done the procedure. Oftentimes, they don't even realize we start when we tell them we're done the procedure. And some of us here, I think, were really surprised just hearing you communicate. That's incredible. Yeah, patients are in a twilight. They're, um, they're a little bit sleepy. They're certainly not uncomfortable, but they're able to follow directions, as you could tell. Speaking of patients, we have one that we want to bring in. Um, his name is uh, Dov uh, Harvey Likely. Hi, Harvey, hi. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Come on over here, sir. I'm Megan. I'm glad I can make it. <laughs> and, and I'm sure um, you know this place well, but I think you're such a unique case and I kind of want you to um, talk about your experience, but you have had both these procedures through the femoral artery and also radial. So you know the difference, not only with recovery, but just what someone can expect. On well, my opinion, uh, it's nine day. I would much rather go through the wrist than there. Well, first of all, um, it takes nine to 10 hours just to recoup when you go through the groin. Yeah, I can hold this for you if you and, want. And um, I'm a big person, I like to eat. And, and when you gotta lay there all that time, and then after you lay there nine or ten hours and it bursts mm -hmm. and then they get a nurse to come in she's got pressure on it for another hour or so she's shaking to death and and the recovery time is so much here hour and a half two hours i'm done i'm up as long as i don't use my left arm i can wiggle around i can sleep I can, it's like nine day i mean there's no comparison to me so having that first experience and then hearing about a new way of doing it well it scared me it, first. i was going to say but then uh, i guess when you hear about the recovery time and the fact that in fact through I've, I've been through this like nine times and i've been through this twice wow i there's no i i, I wish they did this a long time ago but it, it's got to be i guess um a concern for a patient to hear that so it's nice to hear from you who right. has had uh, both can talk yeah, about thank it thank god yeah but like i said i'm Anybody, if they give you a choice, in my opinion, there is no choice. It's a lot faster healing time. When you try to lay down at night time, if they go through the groin, you can't move. They constantly got to come and check on you. Here, as long as I'm not putting any pressure on my left arm, using my left arm, I can turn sideways. I can, it's, oh, a lot better. Incredible. Lot better, and That's Dr. Great. Wong knows he's, he's <laughs> had more than half of my surgeries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's fantastic. He really is. So the reason why I'm still here now. So, well, that's, that's got to be incredible to yeah, hear. Yeah, very, very gratifying. Wow. So, Thanks, Harvey, for coming. Thank you, really guys. appreciate, appreciate it. it. Appreciate it, Harvey. Keep it going. Thank you. I'm serious. Thank you. And my first heart attack was 2003. So, and I've had a bunch of them since then. So I'm still here. So, well, thank you all. Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Great to see thank you. Keep going, guys. You're yeah, going to going here. Thanks. That has got to make your job just incredibly gratifying to hear that. It's. Absolutely. Hearing from patients that have had it both ways, they're the ones that truly appreciate the difference. I think you have patients that have it done only from the radial approach. They just think this is normal. They think it's normal in an hour and a half to be able to walk around and if you had a stent to be able to go home later that day and they have no idea how far this field has come. But to hear from somebody say, you know, I'm, I'm alive because of this place is, is pretty remarkable. So It does. It is remarkable. Amazing. Um, speaking of this place, let's talk a little bit about where we are right now. Um, it's a lounge, 
but this is where patients come really after they've had surgery. Right, so the procedure is done in a cardiac cath lab that you saw in the video. And afterwards, most people, when they come to the recovery area, it's much like a typical hospital scenario where you lay flat in a bed. This is actually called a radial discharge lounge, and it's much more akin to an airport sky lounge or like a waiting room when you're getting your car serviced. And we're gonna take a little walk around and I'll show you some of the different areas, but it's a lot less intimidating for patients. It's a lot friendlier environment, and it's a nice welcome place where patients can take advantage of the fact that they can walk around and don't have to lay flat. Before we get to the tour, a couple more questions. The program, when did it start? So we started our program here in 2010. At that time, I would say 90% of our cardiac catheterizations were done through the groin or the femoral artery. Fast forward to today, where not almost 90% of all cases are done through the transradial approach. So we've had a complete turnaround in that period of time. Also since 2010, we've done over 11,000 procedures through the transradial approach. So we've had tremendous experience with this technique. We want to take a tour? All right, let's walk around. Funny because I think where we are right now, it's, it's hard to imagine that this is part of a hospital unless it's a really nice waiting right. area. Right, now we've made a little makeshift studio, so this is certainly not the way that it's gonna look during the day with our patients. But okay. I wanna start over here because this is an area, Megan, where patients typically come in through after their procedure. And the first thing is when patients come through here, they come through these double doors and they're not on a stretcher, they're in a wheelchair. That's the very first difference. And is that, yeah, I was gonna ask you. Because they don't need to lay flat, right? right. They just had the procedure from their wrist. Okay. Then if you come into this area, I just wanna pan through here first and show you this area. There are eight bays here and this is much more of a traditional nursing unit on this side sure. but these individual rooms if you take a look here these individual rooms do not have a hospital bed right and they have a lounge chair and this is where patients can sit comfortably have that little wristband that's an air-filled diaphragm that's very comfortable and they can sit in these rooms, be monitored with the usual monitoring equipment by the nurses in the nursing stations, and they only stay in this room for about an hour. That's it. That's it. They get dressed in their clothes, uh, and then they come with their wristband on, and they come to the second half of this All right. lounge. And this is the second half of the lounge that's really unique, and this is what makes and differentiates this from your typical hospital recovery area. So here we have some of our audience members, but typically here we have an air seating area set up, and we have a large screen TV where people can sit and watch TV. Where our audience is sitting now, those chairs are usually set up as a reading nook. There are charging stations for cell phones and iPads and laptops, and then over here on this side is a self-serve cafe where, yes. where you can come and get something to drink to and yeah. get something to eat and uh, it's much more like a waiting room for like I said where you're getting your car serviced or even in an airport that is exactly than what it, it is like a like. hospital which has got to be nice for the patient and for their family to come here and see absolutely. something that's a little more warm. Absolutely. And this final room I just want to point out is yeah. our resource center. And the nice thing is that patients are often curious about what their heart catheterization looked like. And this is a room where we can have their patients and the family members be in there and the physician can go through what the angiogram looked like and where we put the stent and draw them a diagram and they can actually see it on their video. Transradial lounge, it's That's amazing. It. It's it's, great. Yeah, it's I've never really seen anything quite like this though. Yeah. So. so we have some more questions. We're gonna get to those. Can you explain the difference between the programs, I guess, with the transradial program here? The approach that we have here is that of a radial first approach. So every patient we evaluate for a heart catheterization, we want to uh, use the transradial approach, whether it be uh, a standard diagnostic catheterization, whether it be a complex bifurcation, a chronic total occlusion, a left main, uh, whether we need the use of even a small device we call a rotablator, which is sort of a roto router we use inside the arteries to remove plaque. These are uh, complex procedures that once, uh, you know, were only performed from the groin with very large bore access sheets. And we have been able to transition to doing all of the most, uh, from the simplest to the most complex procedures uh, through the transradial approach. In addition, the patients that uh, we think benefit the most from the transradial approach are those who have an acute heart attack. These are the ones we're running in to come into the hospital in the middle of the night wow. who have completely occluded vessels. These patients actually not only do better, have less bleeding, they actually live longer 
from having their procedure done through the transradial approach. And that is kind of the philosophy we have here um, in taking care of them. We have a Facebook question, um, and I guess anybody can jump in who uh, might be able to answer this. It's from Lynn Patterson, and she said, if I already had one catheterization through the wrist, could I have another one? The answer is yes, yeah, we absolutely can. Um, you know, we can always access the same site that was accessed before, and if there were any issues in the past, we can, all, of course, access the opposite site. So if one time we go from the right wrist, we can always go from the left wrist in the future as well. There are even certain patients that we do a procedure one day, and we want to break up the procedure and do the second half the next day only because we want to minimize the amount of dye or the length of the procedure. And those patients, oftentimes, we go right back in the same wrist the next day, and they have very little discomfort, if any, and it's very well tolerated. And I imagine, I mean, is everyone a candidate for this? Our rate of using the transradials is well over 90 percent. There are some rare instances that, you know, we may not be able to use the transradial approach, but the vast majority of patients are a candidate for this procedure. Dr. Wong, where do you go from here? What's on the horizon? Well, I have to tell you, this is, um, this is really a commitment to my partners and um, the really dedicated staff here at Union and the leadership. And, the hospital is really, I have to tell you from an administration, understood the benefit of this approach and has supported us to build such a beautiful lounge for our patients. But really where we go from here is to continue to push the envelope of what we can do from the radial approach. And what you're witnessing today is almost a decade worth of work to get to where we are. These gentlemen, my partners and friends to my left and right, have dedicated their time to go through that learning curve and become true experts. And to have a program that has done over 11,000 transradial procedures, the vast majority being done by the three of us here, is really remarkable. So I think that what patients should feel comforted by is that when they come to MedStar Union Memorial and ask for the radial approach, they're going to have physicians that truly also believe it's a better approach for their patients. They're going to have the expertise of people that have done thousands of cases, and then to be able to have the full experience of also being able to recover in a unique novel area like the Discharge Lounge. We have a nice comment from uh, somebody watching on Facebook, uh, Jason Lee, he said, it's great that there's such an advanced procedure that it's available at MedStar Union Memorial Hospital. I mean, do you run into people, I guess, being surprised that, that you do this, I guess, in general, but also that it is offered here and you've done it so much? We have patients who've, that have had a procedure um, many, many years ago done through the leg, and they are surprised that now we can do it through the wrist. Um, the general adoption rate, um, you know, when we look at rates of radial adoption in the United States still fall to only about 30 to 40 percent of centers that routinely perform transradial catheterization. When we look at our colleagues across the, uh, um, across the ocean, Europe and Asia, those rates are as high as uh, 90 percent. So um, we, um, we have been um, kind of early adopters of this and we believe in the safety of this uh, approach and uh, we really do uh, believe this benefits our patients. We often have people who have had a procedure done maybe 10, 15 years ago through the groin approach and they come in with a lot of anxiety because they may not have had a good experience in the distant past and we do the procedure through the transradial approach and the comment is always that you're done already, you know what I mean, <laughs> because it's, it's so different than what they experienced 10 years ago. So. It happens a lot, actually. Traditionally, after having a stent procedure, if you do have a blockage from the groin, patients typically had to spend the night in the hospital. And the reason was is the fear that you could have bleeding at night if you went home that same day. But one of the wonderful uh, unintended benefits of the radial approach is that we're able to safely send uh, the vast majority of patients who've had a stent procedure home the same day because the bleeding risk is virtually zero. So um, we feel that that is a tremendous benefit. And for patients to say, wow, last time I had a stent from the groin, I had to lay flat for six to eight hours and spend the night. Now I'm going home in a few hours and I get to sleep in my own bed. So that's another big benefit. I imagine you have to do a lot of of hand holding with that to let people know that you will be okay to go home, especially if they've had the procedure before and they have that anxiety. We sort of heard that from Harvey saying that he was, you know, very nervous to have this a second time. So I imagine that 
there has to be a lot of education as well. There is, but I think the proof is in their experience. And after they have the wristband taken off and they're walking around in the radio lounge, they realize that if they spent the night, it would really be for no medical reason. So We can safely send patients home. We have been really working with other thought leaders throughout the country in actually developing uh, an approach and protocol to allowing patients to go home the same day. So. Can we answer a quick question from another Facebook viewer? Um, Sarah wrote in and she asked, when would, be, uh, when would a patient not be a good candidate? Is there such a thing when it comes to this procedure? There are some patients, and again, you've heard that we are over 90%, but it's not 100%. There are some patients where the radio artery is tiny mm -hmm. and so small that the catheter wouldn't fit through there. That's rare. There are patients that have had dialysis fistulas in that arm, and so their arm is being used for them to get dialysis, and we certainly don't want to jeopardize that. For the most part, um, 90, over 90 percent of patients are a candidate for this, and there are some anatomic variations where people have some tortuosity in the blood vessels, either in the shoulder or down in the forearm, that we can't get up on that side. But being true radialists and believing in that approach, when we can't go on the right, we'll go on the left. So um, this is something else that differentiates uh, our program. I have to say that like, hearing all this and seeing this place makes these dis the, the, all the stats that we were sharing in the beginning a lot less scary. I mean, this is such a remarkable place and it's amazing what you can do. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you. We want to um, bring Brad Chambers up right now. <coughs> boss man. Oh, stop. stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, behalf of everyone here at MedStar Union Memorial Hospital, Thank you for being here tonight. A special thanks to Megan and our wonderful team from WBAL, but more importantly, these three distinguished physicians who are up here tonight. 